were in two different places. We got um, about a dozen people remote, and then I think you got some number in the room. But is it possible if you could turn the camera for a sec so we could, could see mm -hmm. who's in the room? Yes. I feel like we're a little more connected. I'll be like Vanna White here. Yep. <laughs> oh. I know it's awkward, but and you guys are in the dining facility at Wiesbaden, or well, at at uh, Play Concern in Wiesbaden. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Everybody's being socially distanced. I see. That's good. <laughs> Hi, Ryan Reinhardt. Reinhardt. Great. Thank you. I appreciate that. So um, again. I'm Margaret Bleacham, and I am the vice president, I guess, for uh, programs. And so I get to have the fun of working with our various speakers to set up the presentations. And um, let's see how the camera is still kind of floating all around right now. We're looking at just half of Michael. <laughs> there you go. That's perfect. That's good. He's in the camera now. <laughs> Margaret, if I could, um, Bob, uh, you, you had your camera on. It's blacked out, but if you could turn that off, that would um, free up some screen space. Bob Mentel. Yeah, Bob Mentel. Thank you. Wonderful. <laughs> All right. So again, so, um, so I get to set up the programs and today is yet another great program that um, we're going to learn from and professionally develop. And who we have with us today is Mr. Michael Bilney, who is a global senior principal of asset management and resilience at Cardno. And he, he originates from Golden, Colorado, or I mean, I, I should say he's based in Golden, Colorado. I don't know where he originated though, but uh, he's uh, able to be in person in Wiesbaden today, which is really great. So Mr. Bilney, who goes by the nickname of Mick, has over 30 years of experience in organization management systems and risk yeah. analysis. And he's gonna share that experience with us today. He specializes in enterprise risk reduction and resilience improvement and risk-based investment decision prioritization support, which sounds quite complicated. He, um, to, to accomplish all this work though, Mick analyzes and designs and develops integrated organization management systems and policies and processes. Mick has worked in country in five over in over five different continents in the US, Europe, Africa, Australia, China, and Vietnam. And he's done this for clients such as DOD, the US DOD, I should say, as well as the Australian Defense Forces. He's done he's worked for US government agencies including NASA and NOAA and DOE and Department of State and AID. And he's also worked for private sector clients including uh, international railroads and ports and oil and gas exploration, refining and transmission, uh, manufacturing, nuclear material management. Of course, there's certainly a risk uh, issue there, um, mining and, and mineral processing. So Mick, um, very important to our group, the Society of American Military Engineers, Mick is a Vietnam veteran and a 1968 survivor of the Tet Offensive. And he served in Vietnam for three years, which is really a thank you, Mick, for that important service to our nation. Uh, over the years of January 1968 to January of 1971. And we have a fun fact. I always like to get a fun fact so we can relate to our speakers. Mick has a 15 year old granddaughter and this granddaughter has a habit of trying to convince him that she can speak Japanese. And then she buys him t-shirts with cartoon characters. And once when she knew that he was going to um, try to come up with some novel way of introducing a presentation, she said, just sing, Grandpa, just sing. <laughs> so with that, Mick, let's let's hear it. <laughs> Please. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> Thank you. Margaret, um, do you have visual and are comms OK for us in the room? Yes, we I do. We do have visual and right on Mick 
and I heard him speak just now. So I will speak up if uh, something goes awry. Great. Okay, very good. Thank you, Margaret. And actually, I'm originally from Iowa, so uh, in the Midwest. Um, and thank you for the uh, for the introduction. Uh, I won't be singing today. Uh, that would uh, everybody leave the room if that happened. So uh, what I will talk about are climate change, resilience, and resilience intelligence. And um, here's the topics that I'll cover. In addition to some terms and, and definitions, uh, I'm going to uh, visit with you a little bit about a document that recently came out uh, from DOD that's the Climate Action Plan. And uh, part of why that's really important is that any, any base in the military um, uh, anywhere is going to uh, be covered by um, ongoing efforts uh, uh, with this action plan. And uh, I'll cover some uh, key expectations of that, of that document. Uh, I don't have a lot about it, but I really highly recommend that uh, everyone on this call read that document because uh, it is going to profoundly affect a lot of different plans and, and so forth. And I'll have a little bit more detail about it. I'll also talk about some of the project uh, experiences that uh, uh, that uh, we've developed over the years in uh, our uh, climate and resilience work. And I'll also deal with uh, the uh, uh, some of the lessons we've learned from that, as well as uh, I'm going to talk a little bit towards the end about um, resilience intelligence and why that is important as it applies to uh, disruptions due to climate events. Um, I had talked to, uh, I've, I've talked about tornadoes and other really mm -hmm. severe weather events um, around the world when I do talks like this and, and make presentations. And there are people that uh, would be disbelieving. They'd say, I've never heard of a tornado in Germany. And so uh, I thought I'd show this slide that talks about a tornado that was just uh, uh, several weeks ago uh, here in Germany that did injure uh, uh, several people. And uh, uh, that uh, uh, to where there were emergency response vehicles that had to uh, respond to it. And um, if that wasn't enough evidence, this is a video of a tornado here in Germany, taken back in uh, in March of 2019. So not only can you read about it, but you can see it actually happening. I want to talk a little bit about uh, what our work entails. It's our work isn't about the science of climate change. It's about the effects that climate related events and other natural hazards can have on uh, assets and infrastructure, um, both on uh, military bases as well as, as elsewhere. Um, we confront the problem of how to prioritize asset and other natural hazard uh, types of events and uh, what sort of actions can be taken to increase adaptation and increase the resilience not only of the post but of the of the organization as it applies to the Department of Defense, but also civilian agencies and, and their facilities and as well as business. And so part of the solution to that problem is the development of systematic uh, risk based approaches in terms of our analysis and uh, making sure that those approaches are and solutions are easy to communicate not just outward, but most importantly, upward in the in the organization. And um, also to uh, to identify uh, some of the key principles uh, that are associated with uh, with understanding and, and preparing for and protecting from these kinds of events. It's really important to have a shared understanding of terms and uh, uh, to use existing data. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, and also to make the process that you develop 
uh, or that, that organizations develop for this as simple as possible as opposed to the opposite of that. Uh, the definition of resilience, here's uh, um, one that I synthesized from, uh, uh, from C.S. Holling, who's an early ecologist uh, up there at the top, but also in the uh, Climate Change Adaptation and Resilience uh, a DOD uh, plan, uh, they define resilience, and, and this is really important, uh, particularly for uh, bases like the Clay Cassern. The ability to anticipate, prepare for, adapt to changing conditions and withstand and then respond to these kinds of events and to recover rapidly. It's that recovery um, that uh, um, is really important, particularly in the, in the military mission context. Here are a couple more definitions from the, uh, uh, from the, uh, the DOD uh, climate action plan that I mentioned. Uh, where you can see that adaptation involves adjustment um, uh, to uh, natural uh, systems, natural and human systems, uh, uh, in anticipation of a response. And that mitigation measures um, help to reduce the effects on the climate uh, from, uh, uh, from heat trapping gases and removing carbon dioxide. So there's these terms are, are in this document, and uh, that's another reason why I really encourage everyone on the call to and, and in the room uh, to read it, take a look at it, because these are the terms that are going to be used to communicate what is done over the, uh, the coming time. There's a difference between climate and weather that's explained in the document, and you can see the, uh, the definitions here in terms of weather as the fluctuating state of the atmosphere and a climate refers to the average weather over a certain period of time. So again, being able to have these definitions laid out in this document uh, will help you understand what kinds of, of actions uh, will be ultimately be developed um, as time goes on and the assessments are made and the documents are, uh, are developed. The Climate Action Plan makes these kinds of, of points in the forward that was uh, provided by the uh, Secretary of Defense. They're driven by an executive order uh, requiring agencies to develop them. Uh, it requires uh, DOD to prioritize uh, climate change and all the activities that it has and, and so forth. Um, the Climate Act, uh, Adaptation Plan um, provides a roadmap to ensure that the department maintains the ability to operate under the changing circumstances that we find ourselves in uh, due to climate in, in these days. And um, significantly about this document is it will incorporate climate uh, risk into planning, modeling, simulation, war gaming, um, such as, and, and other documents such as the National Defense Strategy, and identify key vulnerabilities at each of the posts that's uh, that's covered under it. Here's the uh, uh, table of contents uh, from this from this plan. Uh, as you can see, it includes a policy statement and a strategic framework. There are five priority adaptation actions, lines of effort, and I'll talk about two of them that uh, I think are most important uh, with respect to uh, supply chain uh, resilience and uh, um, uh, the uh, the uh, training and equipment uh, component, and also there are four topic areas that you can that you can see, and uh, uh, the plan actually is is very well written. It's it's not uh, it's it doesn't use technical jargon, um, and so uh, to familiarize with those yourself with those topics um, is really important. Um, the uh, Also, I found an interesting component in there about uh, uh, the US European Command uh, responsibilities for their um, area of responsibility. And that uh, it makes a comment that the expected sea level rise here uh, in the area around the European Command is going to 
rise uh, increase anywhere from a foot to seven feet over the over the next uh, uh, what amounts to 80 years. That's a big difference, but it's also a big uh, a big change. And you can imagine how those rising sea levels will affect uh, the coastal locations uh, that uh, are within the uh, uh, European Command area of responsibility, and that additional engineering assessments will be required uh, to determine the ability of that infrastructure in those areas to accommodate and adapt to those increasing levels. And if you've ever been to one of the bases that depends on uh, on piers and docks and shipping and uh, access, uh, whether it's to uh, whether it's a defense mission or it's some other mission, um, uh, you know, you can understand why that's really going to be important in this area. The resilient and bad, uh, the, the line of effort, the first one, the resilience, uh, resilient built and natural installation infrastructure, uh, this one is, is important because it, it affects uh, what the assets are on every post that are covered by the uh, by the action plan and uh, and the strategies that will be developed. Um, and you can see what the uh, 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 what's really important in terms of the focus areas there, uh, as well as that progress and performance is going to be tracked. Uh, there'll be metrics developed uh, for these. Building standards, which I'll also have a little uh, video about uh, uh, coming up, will be updated to ensure the continuity of operations uh, given uh, increasingly severe climate events. A little bit more about this in terms of uh, uh, the importance of preserving testing and training space, uh, uh, completing climate informed uh, natural resource plans is a key component. One of the, one of the major elements uh, that you'll see throughout this and some of the project examples I'll give involve working with uh, with local communities. And there are a lot of reasons to do that um, because no military base operates independently of the country that it's in or the community that, that it's proximate to. And uh, you can see what the outcome is in terms of the expectation uh, for infrastructure uh, to um, the, be in place that's necessary for a successful mission uh, completion. Supply chain resilience and innovation is the other one that I, I wanted to point out particularly um, that uh, and there's a lot of uh, discussion about this. Uh, there's an executive order that came out, uh, uh, executive order uh, 14007 um, and uh, or 71. Anyway, there's an executive order on that. Um, DOD must consider the logistic support of supply chains like fuel and power requirements, especially where uh, the uh, locations that are uh, more complex, more austere, and uh, to remain agile and flexible. Um, I'd like to ask if there's anyone here that has a good definition for the word agile in this context. This is the reason why words are important. Um, Agile, um, the way that it's used now, uh, has a lot to do with being not only quick to respond, but also being able to have some independence in terms of how decisions are made and what decisions are made. And, and that's uh, normal in the kind of context that it's used here. So obviously the military being a chain of command um, organization, that has some profound meanings in terms of how that uh, how that term will be applied, and so I encourage you to really uh, uh, really look at the words that are used in the in the documentation. Um, one of the uh, uh, areas of emphasis is that the climate resilient supply chain is one where uh, DoD can assure that key components are available, and anyone that's dealt with logistics. Anyone that's dealt with supply understands how a long logistics tail uh, can become highly complex in an austere environment for the military.
just a little bit more about this. Uh, you can see what the focus areas are here, uh, including uh, climate uh, change considerations in access to uh, 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 to supply chains and looking for the outcome of uninterrupted access to key supplies, materials, chemicals, and service. Uninterrupted. So that means a heck of a lot of strengthening uh, needs to be done. And there's a, a good test of supply chains that's been conducted over the last year and a half with uh, what we've gone through with COVID um, around the world. Those performance metrics that I mentioned are going to cover uh, the uh, initially uh, including the presence or absence of these types of climate hazards. And these are standard, whether it's uh, coastal or marine flooding, heat and drought, energy, uh, wildfire, uh, and other uh, weather events. And they're going to have include that in the Advana, the DOD um, uh, enterprise analytics platform. Here's the, uh, 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 there's been a mention recently of the Army uh, climate change strategy uh, that is to come soon. And that's going to have a, reportedly uh, by uh, folks who have seen some of the strategy, a focus on improving energy related capabilities and efficiencies, uh, uh, preparing what is identified as a climate ready force, uh, optimizing resilient and sustainable infrastructure and the others that you can see. Uh, they're going to focus on training combat forces to adapt to weather and natural landscape changes. Uh, so this strategy, when it comes out, will affect uh, uh, how bases operate and how they're protected as well uh, for that training capability for the Army. The first uh, example that I'd like to, uh, to show you has to do with a, uh, an analysis that we've done at two military bases in the US where we looked at uh, uh, sea level rise, uh, a storm and tidal surge, as well as coastal riverine and pluvial flooding. Pluvial is, uh, is uh, flooding that happens incidental to um, a, a riverine event or it's inland uh, flooding due to some major precipitation. And uh, we analyze the, the inundation of these uh, high precipitation events and what was happening on the post uh, as it applied to the what's called uh, the gray uh, infrastructure and risks to those uh, to vertical as well as horizontal assets. And understanding that your horizontal assets can be just as affected, in fact, even more so negatively affected uh, uh, than, um, than the uh, 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 vertical assets. Uh, is really important. We looked at rail, bridges, roads, buildings, uh, storage and transfer areas, and uh, um, eventually the stormwater management uh, structures. And that's where we identified a key root cause of some of the events that were uh, that were happening at the base. Um, the stormwater system suffered from the negative effects of far too many years of deferred maintenance or uh, delayed repair, uh, limited enhancements. And that caused uh, them to have a lack of capacity over the increasing severity of the storms that were occurring. Uh, so something as, as seemingly benign as stormwater management ditches and the, uh, and the various grates and, and uh, uh, support uh, components that they have uh, were really affected to the point to where it disrupted mission critical assets and interrupted uh, critical mission uh, operations. And so what we uh, recommended was an engineering analysis analysis to be done to determine what size those the uh, the uh, uh, stormwater management system needed to be and uh, uh, so forth. Other kinds of recommendations that we made had to do with raising roads. Uh, where they were going to be inundated, either they were being inundated uh, presently or were going to be with uh, increasing sea level rise, as well as moving certain buildings and, and functions out of the areas. Um, one, of the, uh, one of the longest uh, uh, analyses we did took over five years, and we did this for NOAA, 
starting back in, in 2011 and finishing it in, uh, uh, in late 17. And we looked at 3,200 properties and narrowed it down to their uh, uh, just over 100 and uh, identified initially for them, because that's what our scope was, their top 10 most at risk climate change events. And these were their campuses where they have their buildings and, and various components. Um, and the reason that I have the caution in there about uh, too narrow a focus on the top 10 or the top five or the top three is because we found very little marginal difference in the data between the top 10 and the top 40 uh, to the point of where they really didn't, uh, they had a top 10, but they also had a top 40 that was uh, very close based on the data that, that we have. So in other words, by focusing on too narrow a number, um, uh, organizations can miss the boat on where their risk is at and what the ultimate cost and uh, uh, considerations ought to be. And those are the kinds of things that we uh, develop for them, including a standardized process that they could use uh, enterprise-wide uh, to identify at the rest of their, uh, identify the, the threats and vulnerabilities at the rest of their posts. Here's the kinds of things that we looked at uh, relevant to identifying the risk. We use the, uh, um, the likelihood indicators as you see them there, including storm surge, uh, the uh, precipitation amounts, um, whether there was flood or riverine uh, from riverine or, or coastal sources and so forth. And then we used uh, their current replacement value as the severity co component for the, for the risk calculation. So in other words, uh, we developed uh, uh, matrices like this that identified uh, uh, risk associated with uh, the elevation of the facility and its proximity to uh, whether it's a river or a, or a coastal area. And then we looked for natural breaks in the, in the data in terms of current replacement value uh, for the severities and uh, divided into high, medium, and low. That was the... Uh, uh, that's just one of the components that we developed in the prioritization method. And we identified uh, uh, adaptation and resilience improvement plans for them that took into account the components that you see there. Um, things as simple as that are common day, commonly understood now uh, as don't put your emergency generators in your basement if you're subject to flood. And uh, um, try to have more than one way in and out of the facility, uh, because if that one way in and out floods, you're not going to be able to get the fuel in to uh, uh, put into your emergency gener generator, even if it's up on the roof. So there are a variety of things that we uh, identified uh, along with uh, uh, rough order of magnitude cost estimates. Uh, it's frequently asked why it is that we do um, risk-based resilience planning or why should it be done? For one thing, it helps allocate scarce resources uh, where they're needed most to uh, uh, buy down the most risk in the, in the shortest period of time. It allows the folks who identify these costs and these risks to defend those recommendations upward into uh, leadership and the chain of command, uh, the folks that really provide the money to affect them. And to meet leadership and uh, requirements and expectations. It, it's interesting to note that that uh, um, it's expected that every dollar invested in building resilient infrastructure saves six dollars in future cost. And uh, this number gets uh, uh, handed around uh, uh, quite a bit. Uh, and four dollars in cost savings for uh, designing above uh, code minimums. So why do you focus on the most critical assets? Well, the most important uh, assets to the mission or business uh, uh, operations uh, uh, are the assets that are most critical. And if, a criti if the critical assets fail, they have uh, a highly negative effect on key objectives, whether those are mission or business. And the greater that negative effect, the greater the criticality. 
So it's really important to identify and prioritize those types of assets uh, that are most critical to the uh, to the uh, the mission or the business operation, and those that, and then determine uh, how bad those effects are and how likely it is to occur. And the inter interdependency that those assets have to the overall mission. The Here's resilience diamond is really just a way to um, provide a graphic representation of key elements of resilience in terms of how the organization prepares for, uh, protects itself and its people and its community, responds to disruptions and recovers from them. Maybe repeat the comment. Huh? Could you hear the comment? Yeah. Okay. No, I don't think anyone in the room could hear okay. it. Okay. Um, let me see if I can go back and take it off. I don't think it's going to come on. Uh, the, the the resilience diamond. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, there was a recording that came up on there. Uh, the resilience diamond is just an easy way uh, to demonstrate what the components of resilience are in terms of uh, preparation, adaptation, response, and recovery. And uh, in other words, to prepare uh, by identifying and analyzing uh, threats and hazards, adapting by protecting uh, infrastructure, uh, responding, that means coordinating uh, uh, security, an emergency response, not only on the post, but also uh, with the local community or uh, the regional area. And uh, recovered the, uh, uh, with the, the recovery is really important and looking at uh, what percent of, of production or mission uh, capability, uh, delivery and capacity and the time and cost for that, uh, for what it's expected to be. And then um, improving or increasing resilience business continuity through effectiveness and efficiency uh, uh, in terms of recovery uh, from acute and long onset disruptions. An acute disruption would be a hurricane, a long onset would be sea level rise. Here's, Here's the how in terms of systematic analysis and screening of of, of a resilience analysis. And you can see that it uh, uh, shifts from looking at what the current asset portfolio is uh, and identifying a resilience baseline of the operation and the infrastructure that's available, identifying what the hazards and uh, uh, natural hazards and climate threats may be, what the level of exposure and vulnerability is at the post, and then doing a risk-based rating, ranking, and prioritization of the not only the uh, the effects but also of which assets are most critical, and then resilience improvement. And the what includes those items on the on the left: uh, functionality, supply chain, security, uh, on into communications, not only internally <clears throat> but also with the community as a whole. One of the things they found out uh, uh, during Katrina <clears throat> and uh, in other uh, similar events is they have multiple different communication systems that didn't that didn't allow uh, various uh, response entities to talk with one another. That caused a lot of problems. Uh, this is a uh, a project that we're working on currently, where we're looking, we're developing a prioritization method for the organization to cover. Uh, over 250 locations in um, <clears throat> over 150 countries around the world. And we're developing a screen level natural hazard risk assessment, identifying uh, a vulnerability and uh, data gaps and evaluating capital uh, uh, projects and major acquisition processes uh, to look to where the program itself can have a, a greater role uh, to play in the organization and determining the um, the priorities of, of focus for investments in in the locations that are most at risk. Uh, it incorporates 
climate security and resilience considerations and policy, uh, working with uh, uh, regional and facility engineers, uh, recommending refinements. Uh, we're developing uh, an in com internal communication plan for them to communicate not only about the project, but also about the, uh, the prioritization effort that's going on and what sort of activities they'll do. And then we'll recommend opportunities for the uh, program to participate uh, further, deeper into the organization. These are the kinds of natural hazards that we're looking at, uh, including uh, tsunamis, landslides, um, earthquakes, along with the, with the typical uh, climate uh, components, and uh, um, we'll also look at uh, potential additional data sets to what they have. We're going to make uh, on-site visits uh, for observation to identify what could be done at uh, uh, a couple of their of their highest place to high, highest risk uh, facilities. <clears throat> Why the emphasis on natural hazards? as opposed to just climate, is because it can get complex like it recently did in Haiti with the 7.2 um, earthquake starting off the show, and then they got a hurricane on top of it, and that brought rain. And so each of those complicated the recovery and the rescue efforts uh, that they had. And uh, so that's why uh, looking at natural hazards as opposed to just climate hazards um, is is really important. Particularly, uh, like the action plan says, in austere environments. Also, <clears throat> it's important to note that you can do this same type of analysis for programs and departments and organizations, and that's what the NASA uh, example is about, uh, with uh, looking at uh, um, what we did was we uh, um, we benchmarked the uh, the department against other organizations like the European Space Agency, um, the Air Force, and uh, a large international uh, petroleum company. And we identified where certain things could be uh, standardized or centralized um, to deal with uh, an expected budget uh, cut of around 25%. And so looking at this, we could identify what programs could be made more resilient by doing certain things and handling them a different way. Some of the lessons that we learned in, in both the DOD and civilian um, projects are uh, use what exists. Use the data that you have first before you go out and buy any. Um, use what's publicly available, because there's a lot of it now, far more than what there was even five years ago uh, in NASA databases, NOAA databases, and, and others. But then if, if uh, you decide that it's worth it, you can augment that uh, with what's available um, in the private sector. Um, look at locally developed data uh, for accuracy as opposed to just taking it at, at face value. Um, and really doing analysis of, of site-specific kinds of components requires you to be on the ground. You can't do it remotely. You have to be there to see what the conditions are, and uh, 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 both on the post as well as in the community. And uh, using facility condition assessment data, FCI uh, data, whether you use builder or you use something else, uh, uh, making sure that, that, that your asset inventory is up to date and that data is accurate and effective is really, really important because that's going to help you establish that baseline that I mentioned earlier. Participate in regional, state, county, and community planning. Any, any planning that you can get involved in that's outside the fence line is really important because ultimately it's going to come down to in a natural disaster of, of dealing with outside agencies or dealing with outside supply chains, outside the post. So it's really important to know what sort of plans are being done, not just for, uh, uh, for climate, but other sorts of emergency response, particularly since COVID and since the, uh, um, those kinds of events 
um, being able to understand what's going on outside is really important, um, as well as being able to incorporate that data into your uh, continuity of operations plans and, and so forth. And remember, whatever method it is that you use to prioritize uh, doesn't ultimately take the place of the decision maker. They're really designed to support the decision maker, not to uh, preclude them. I'd like to visit a little bit about uh, um, analyzing resilience and addressing the concepts um, I described uh, and using what I refer to as resilience intelligence. And it's what's needed in addition to just doing the things in, uh, that the organizations did in the examples uh, that I gave you. Now that's a hailstorm that happened in Germany. So what I immediately thought of when I saw this was what if that was an airfield where there were airplanes, helicopters, support vehicles located. So the point being is that these kinds of events can happen. What, what can you learn uh, from them? And what sort of understanding can you take away based on um, on these kinds of events and bring it into the into the workplace? Well, as as I as we all know, uh, the recent experience with the increase in in really highly severe storms throughout the world, whether it's Haiti, <clears throat> tsunamis in Japan, or most recently the COVID um, situation that we've had to deal with, it's really important uh, become apparent that increasing uh, resilience is necessary for organizations to survive and thrive in this new world that we've got uh, with climate change. And so developing resilience intelligence is going to help um, improve uh, what can be done. Here you can see what the dictionary definition of, uh, of intelligence is. And it involves learning and understanding um, and the skilled use of reason to apply knowledge and uh, also to measure the achievement of objectives. Well, there are certain <clears throat> um, building blocks of uh, resilience and what it takes to develop these uh, necessary competencies is it means developing uh, key competencies and it's necessary for all organizations to, uh, to do this given the current circumstances that we have. Integrating these building blocks um, of intelligence with systematic asset management and resilience analysis uh, will uh, help increase resilience intelligence. And developing and increasing resilience intelligence can help organizations then be more resistant to the types of disruptive events, not only that we see in climate, but also when uh, uh, combined with other natural hazards. And resilience intelligence <clears throat> enhances the ability of an organization and their people to be more agile. Like is now mentioned in the uh, in the uh, Dodd Climate Action Plan and to help uh, uh, prepare in a more systematic and, and organized manner um, in dealing with the kinds of, of, of problems and de developing effective solutions to those problems as, as it relates to whether it's climate change or um, other natural hazards. And it will result in more in, in improved and more effective plans and documents associated with this, like the, the Climate Action Plan calls for. Resilience and in intelligence is really at the heart and necessary for organizations uh, to survive. And um, if they're subject to natural hazards of any type, whether the climate or otherwise, including those what we call black swan events, COVID is the perfect example. 
low likelihood, high severity. But when was the last one? 100 years ago, back in the early 1900s with the, the Spanish flu. And so a lot of organizations ignore uh, low likelihood and high, high severity events, and they don't take them into account in their planning. Obviously, COVID has taught us something uh, about that. Um, so leaders should understand that they do have complacency biases in many cases, and they shouldn't hide their heads in the sand, um, thinking that the problem won't appear during their tenure. Uh, it really needs to, they need to consider low likelihood, high severity events when they do planning and when they test particularly. And some of the documents that uh, that you'll see come out um, and indeed that climate action plan itself uh, uh, talks about uh, what's going to be required in the new documents that will be developed. As I mentioned, from master plans on down to uh, resilience um, improvement plans. So uh, being able to test them and make sure that you've got the business continuity uh, objectives set right, that you're going to measure them and test them is really important. Uh, it's going to be necessary for not only organizations to exist, but to continue to exist. And it, it, resilience intelligence can, can be key to this rapidly changing world that we have. And uh, rather than stubbornly holding to old ideas and ways of thinking that are no longer relevant. So that is my presentation for the day. And I'll take uh, questions. Thanks, thanks, Mick. Um, you know, that was just a fantastic intro and primer, I would say, to resilience and the, the risk management planning and, and preparation that needs to support that resiliency. I, I also think it gave us a really um, a great perspective on the really wide range of issues that have to be considered. This is just a really big area. And um, and I like that you gave us some specific approach, uh, you know, tips on how to how to get at this a little bit. Um, clearly, you you've been somebody that's been spending a lot of time thinking about this and and working on it. And so I really you know appreciate on behalf of all of us that you're sharing some of that. It certainly opened my eyes to a lot of things. Um, be, so, so we've got people in the room there with you that can ask questions and we've got people online that can ask questions. What I would ask is that if you're online, that if you have a question or even a comment too, I mean, we can have a little discussion here, that you would type it into the, into the chat and then I can, I can bring it up or call on you. And then if you're in the room, Lindsay's there and she's going to help um, facilitate people speaking. But what I do ask so that those of us that are online can hear is if you'll get to be near the microphone or, or, or Lindsay can repeat your question so that everybody can hear it. And, and, and I'm going to ask the first question, though. So while everybody's kind of thinking about what they want to say is you mentioned, you know, we're we, of course, in the Rhine Mind chat post, we're um, focused on Europe and you mentioned about uh, some of the impacts to UCOM. And specifically, I recall you talking about the, the sea level rise of anywhere from what one to seven feet, I think. Um, I mean, in the next 70 years, that's that's huge. Um, and and obviously we have it's going to have tremendous impact on things that include the military that we support there. Um, even even, you know, the US military isn't so much on the coast, only in some of the places. However, that's how they're getting all their supplies, of course. Um, so with that, um, do you, is there anything you know that you can share with us that either UCOM uh, specifically or, uh, or, or Europe in general is doing to, to, to try to get at these issues? Well, I do know that the Navy is, uh, is looking at these just as all now, DOT agencies are are doing. 
uh, both because of the executive order, but uh, also because of the action plans that they're required to do. So they'll be looking at uh, uh, what the expectations are for their peers and, uh, and docks and uh, the infrastructure around uh, the ports where those that rising sea level will be felt the most. So at least that uh, that will go on. Uh, I think uh, uh, elsewhere it will be wise if the if the military and the European Command uh, looks at the linkages between those bases that you alluded to, uh, and uh, in terms hey, of their supply. Margaret. Yeah. Yes. Uh, this is Gary Russ. Obviously, you know I'm in UCOM. And uh, we're putting together a task order that'll have some requirements. Uh, we have also uh, included the DCAT, which is the DOD climate assessment tool into the Engineer AFRICOM conference so that people can now start figuring out what uh, that is. That assessment has to be done by 1 January of 2023. Um, and so we're working our way to building the uh, the team in UCOM and obviously with the subordinate uh, agencies and uh, component commands over. Excellent. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Gary. I appreciate that input. Uh, are there any questions in the room? Yep. Yes. Can, can you hear me from here or should I? I'll, I'll hand spin around to see okay. you. Okay. All nice. All right. Cool. Uh, my name is Brian again. So uh, I, you mentioned Katrina. So I worked in New Orleans with the Army Corps of Engineers for several years. So um, we definitely saw the effects of, of climate change. So, um, you know, as we worked on the flood control structures, you know, we did our, our best to model, you know, the, the sea level, uh, you know, for to design for a 1% in a 100 year storm. Um, you know, with your, your talk, how do, you, how do you think, you know, in 50 years, the, the accuracy of those models how do you think that those will change? Um, you know, this, is, this has big implications for New Orleans and you know, near dear to my heart, but. Uh, I hate to predict the future. Yeah. Um, I, it, it, I don't know how the models will change, first of all, but what I do believe is that people need to pay significant attention to the data as it continues to come in and to, and to uh, use the, the best data that they can they can obtain, whether that's locally available or uh, uh, obviously it's available through NASA. There's data that's available through NASA and NOAA and those kinds. But uh, to really continue to keep an eye on how the models will shift over time, because each time they run, it's, it's just a snapshot in time. So you have to continue to update it. You have to, you can't just create it once, do a baseline and say, uh, that's good, I know where it's going to be because conditions will change. And only by monitoring it and, and making sure that your plans adjust on the same basis that the data adjusts, uh, will you be able to um, increase your resilience um, given the likelihood of those severe events. It's gonna happen again. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Anyone else in the room? I'll come a bit closer. Hi, uh, Brian Osborne. Um, following on probably that question, these the extreme rainfall events that we've had, particularly in Germany, yeah. uh, indicated that the flood mapping that we have doesn't cover everything that, that needs. There were areas there which were you know, buildings were swept away, yes. which were well outside the uh, the mapping, the, the flood mapping. So how do we deal with that? Do we, is it just we have to accept that and focus on recovery or because otherwise we really don't know where the floods could occur in the future with these events? Well, can, there's can you repeat the question. Or can people hear it? Could you hear? Can people hear the question? Yes, we can hear it really okay. well. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Um, the I'll go back to the data. You have to be able to use what you see happening to adjust it. And uh, what you can see are the insurance companies, for one thing, as an indicator of what I'm talking about, um, increasing their premiums for 
um, any business, any home that's located in an area that has experienced the kinds of events that you've had here in Germany, as well as the kind of events that, that Brian spoke about um, in the New Orleans area. Uh, so uh, the reason they're doing that is because they see the risk as increasing. So um, given that that's what you observe, uh, it, it tells you that revisiting the models that have been used, whether it's in Germany or it's in the US, um, for floodplain determination is really important. And there's a lot of smart people here. Um, and those smart people, um, engineers um, and others, uh, need to, to, to revisit those kinds of, of what used to be a 500 year event now occurs, what, every other year? So, um, and be able to make the adjustments. Um, do you rebuild in an area that, that is so subject to flooding that you're going to have to continue to replace that asset, that structure, um, that home, or do you move? Um, and those are, those are decisions that, that, that a country, a post, um, a command need to at least be aware of, of, the, of the risk and what that risk is and then make those decisions based on their best judgment. Anyone else in the room? All right, Margaret, I think we're good for the in-person group. Yeah, for now. Yeah, so um, somebody might be spurred to another thought, but Nick, I wanna, you know, hearing you talk about all this m <laughs> makes me think a lot about mm -hmm. the, um, but is the American, I should know this, the, the society that um, develops the grade of our, of our U.S. infrastructure and gives it a D plus and says that it's going to be, you know, how many billions of dollars to, you know, bring our, our infrastructure back up to the, to the where it should be. You know, we're mainly thinking of roads and bridges and stuff. Well, I mean, that's been kind of an ongoing story for a very long time because, of course, nobody is ever able to commit that level of effort at one time to fix it so so this makes me think about that uh, of of you know the logical conclusions we we go out and we do these massive surveys of the state of of risk and in, 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 in to climate um, change at our bases for instance and come up with a phenomenally huge number uh, dollar figure that's going to have to to be invested. But I mean, how do you see that all playing out? I mean, what's the right, what's going to be the right approach? I know you sort of touched on that a little bit, trying to trying to talk about what's the most high priority, but also pointed out that you really can't differentiate. So, I mean, can you talk a little bit more about that? Well, uh, given the executive order and the and given the agencies that are going to have to have to respond, the Department of Transportation in the U.S. will have a big role in determining what those threats and hazards amount to, what the risk levels are, and how to adjust uh, uh, budgets and permitting to account for that, and to be able to um, uh, help not only at the federal level, but also the state level and, and local levels, determine where the risk is and where certain placement of infrastructure um, should be um, as the investments flow forward into the, into the communities uh, to make sure that uh, they're done in a way um, that helps the community be most resilient. Uh, and that means look at the, at the floodplain issue and does that highway need to go there or should it be someplace else that will protect it from uh, being flooded out uh, on an annual basis? Uh, there, those are the kinds of things I think that will, that will come into play. The, the guidance is certainly there, the data is there, so it will come down to uh, the folks that, that need to use the data, the engineers that are involved, um, as well as community leadership, um, being able to um, use the data to make decisions so that decisions are data informed as opposed to um, 
friend informed. Thanks, that's very good. Thank you. Sure. Did we have anybody else online that had any comments or want to yeah. contribute to the discussion? Just raise your hand, please. I know Gary, you had your hand raised, but did did you already address what you were going to say? Yes, ma'am. OK, thanks. OK, we, we have a couple more minutes. I, I, I have I'm going to ask another question. Then. So, um, you know, I know the Navy, of course, the Navy's they know they're vulnerable because they're sitting right there next to the water. And they've they've they were getting at this several years ago. I know they came out with their uh, act, their climate adaptation plan um, several years ago. But the army may be feeling that th they're getting into it now. With their you said their strategy is due out soon, and you mentioned um, it. It was called a climate ready force. Do you, do you have any, you may not know, but do you have any idea what the Army is envisioning as a climate ready force? Uh, I think that the that the action plan does a pretty good job of, uh, of describing it, um, but uh, they're also talking about uh, in that DOD document, uh, uh, increasing climate literacy throughout the force, uh, throughout command, as well as uh, uh, line soldiers, airmen, sailors, uh, in other words, across the full spectrum, climate literacy, um, and it means to be better read, better informed, uh, to be able to take uh, uh, the climate events and the, and the conditions and the characteristics that we see now and that the data tells us is likely to happen in the future and to bring that to bear on all levels of, of command uh, strategy development and decision making. So a climate ready force would be the outcome or the outgrowth of, of being better informed, making decisions about um, what needs to be done to um, protect uh, uh, the, the, the capability of the force to execute its mission. Very good, thank you. So um, I, I think this is uh, what you've you, what you've addressed today is just an indication that we've really come a long way, and that people really are, you know, opening their eyes to these issues. And of course, they're happening. I think more frequently, and we have to. And so um, it it's still got probably a long way to go, but it's it's a big start from where we were even you know ten years ago. So I, I, I'm, I'm sure it's very fun for you to be on the forefront of this effort. And, and uh, we hope you'll continue to um, engage with our post and share what you've learned. Um, we welcome you to come back anytime and join our discussions. And um, I really wanna thank you very much for, uh, for what you've contributed to our development today, Mick. It's been my pleasure. Thank you, Great. General. And, and I will um, turn it back over to Brian. I think he might have something. Yes. Nick, I'd like to, uh, on behalf of SAME, uh, present you with uh, a coin. Thank you. So thank you, thank very, you much, very much for, for uh, you know, coming here and, and speakers like you, you know, make this uh, post strong and and uh, really appreciate everybody attending and, and the questions. And thank you for, for discussing this difficult topic that many people don't uh, give the time of day yet and uh, don't fully understand. So I think it's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. So with that, um, thank you all uh, for uh, coming and uh, I'll close out. Um, yeah. I, I have, uh, you know, um, next Thursday there will be um, a follow on session to this where Mick is going to talk about more about the uh, resilience and resilience intelligence for the Kaiser's Loudon post. So I'll just put a plug in for that. If you're interested in that, you can sign up on the um, Kaiser's Loudon post website. All right, back over to you, Brian. Thanks, everyone. All right, Brian, you mentioned at the beginning uh, something on the 2nd of November. What, what is that? Can you go to that slide? Get my slide down. 
Yeah, that's a good idea. If we go back to the program slide, I can go into a little more detail. You want Charisse, me? you want to jump in too? That's the projector slide. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Charisse, the question was, uh, you know, November 2nd, the, the luncheon. If you want to speak to that. The um, the Rhine Mine Post will be hosting a luncheon and a um, social event on the 2nd of November uh, during the AFRICOM UCOM engineer conference. Uh, it's going to be hybrid. We will allow, we will be able, if you're interested on the um, sessions, you'll be able to uh, log into those. We have an opportunity for our sustaining members uh, if they want to have a tabletop exhibit at the event. Uh, just get a hold of me or Mike Erbach. I don't know if he was able to join the call. I think he had um, something else come up, but uh, you can certainly get a hold of me. I'll drop my um, email in the chat uh, if you want to participate in that on the 2nd of November. Margaret. And, and I'll just add, um, I, I asked for everybody's patience a little bit. We've got several different programs in the next couple months that are, they're in the cooking stage right now. Um, they're, w one of them, as you see on there, um, we have one that's gonna be an AAR of the Europe district's torn um, season that we just finished up their end of year. And, that's something that they're basically going to provide the uh, the program for the district is, and they're just trying to settle on a date. Um, it'll probably be in December, but again, we just haven't been able to pin it down because of people's schedules. And then um, we're also um, going to have a joint panel type discussion about how to get at some of the challenges with cost estimating with our military work and it, especially in the, you know, because of the Oconus uh, uh, locations being even more difficult. And this is gonna be where we can fit it in somewhere between December and January. And then also in January, we're gonna have our regular annual program update from Europe District. So those will be three separate events they're all going to happen in the next couple of months, but we just haven't worked out the dates with everybody yet. So I uh, will get that word out as soon as we can. Thanks. Back to you, Brian. All right. Well, that's all I have. So thank you, everybody, for joining online and thank you for joining in person. So with that, we'll see you uh, at the next event. So thank you very much.